definitely going to talk about something at some point and just go, yep. <laughs> and now to my favourite feature. <laughs> and now to the communist corner. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that would be a brilliant... <laughs> It's Friday from a converted bedroom somewhere in the south of England, only slightly edited and not at all live. They're the cream in your coffee, the double six to your snake eyes, the 22 to your 21, the David Star of board games, the titans of the tabletop, they're really good at flux, they've settled Catan, the sultans of snakes and ladders, the ayatollahs of Agricola, the betrayers at House on the Hill, the kings of Tokyo, the lords of Waterdeep, they are men at work. They put the bang in bang, the champions of the wild, the employers of fun, they always have a ticket to ride, your favourite podcast, favourite podcast, it's the Everybody Dies Podcast. Hello, I'm Steve. I am Daryl. And, yeah, not the funniest of intros that we've done. This is, by the way, podcast number 18. If you're joining us on YouTube, we've been doing 17 of these beforehand that you can find over on SoundCloud. Um... I think if you just search Everybody Dice there, you'll yeah. come across it. We're, we're running dry on uh, what we're good at. Um, this is the problem. We're not good at a lot. Um, <laughs> and it seems like we've run dry. We have. I, I'm sure there's more we can throw into this later on. But we're, at least this, this is kind of like the reset point. This yeah, is kind yeah. of... We're expanding our horizons as a podcast. Oh my god, this can be like the... Uh, you know when they get a good film? Alright, let's, let's take Face Off, for instance. Sure. And now they decide they want to remaster it and make a remake. That's this right now. We yep. are the new Face Off. <laughs> <laughs> the Face Off of board games. Yeah! Or board gaming podcast. That could uh, work. Maybe we have to start dumping the celebrity. By the way, the celebrity this week, David Starr, is a fantastic independent pro wrestler that we have blatantly stolen our intro from. Uh... Thanks, David Starr. Cheers! <laughs> Just out of curiosity, would you play a face-off game if there was one? I, how would they make I don't it know. work? I just don't know. Would it be like a hidden role Like thing a betrayal thing, yeah. The other players around the board or something, you've swapped faces with someone, but you're not entirely sure who yet. And it's only when you bump into one another or something, when there, there's like incidents when you can bump into one another, you see their face and go, you have my face. Unless, wait, hold on, well, what if one player is the face-off yeah. and the other players have got to try and suss out who the other face-off is? So like, basically that okay. person is infiltrating the family Yeah. and then say, um, uh, what's his name? Oh, uh, God, what's his name? John Travolta? I was trying to think of Nicholas his, Cage? No, I was trying to think of the, the character's names, but I can't remember. Yeah, let's oh. say John, John Travolta's character. We've got to infiltrate his family, and one of us is is not actually, you know. Okay. So it could even be his mum. I feel like this could easily be a segment on the podcast of we just try to make a game in the middle of the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, Every we, week. Right. We'll get Patreon. Paper. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get our Patreons to give us a subject, and we'll make it. And we'll game. make a game out of it. It may not be great, and we'll never play it, but no. it will be made. We are in no way games designers at all. So uh, I think we could give a good go at it. We'll give it a go. Yeah, I'm sure. How how hard could it be? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's tremendous. After all our research. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Uh, how are you anyway, Daryl? Um, I am better. Uh, I will not go into health reasons, but I am better. Um, I'll give you a clue. I got shot in the face. Did we? Was this covered on the last podcast, or was this not even a thing on the last podcast? I think it was because. Yeah, I had to like leave sort of midway, midway through just to put on oh, my yes, eye drops. Yes. And it was just really, really weird because you guys were just so basically the guys were just like sort of carrying on talking. I get up and slide off and then just put some eye drops and they're looking at me going, What's <laughs> <you doing?" laughs> but still trying to maintain a professional kind of audio yeah. quality. It's probably for the best we didn't start the video podcast last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh my eye. <laughs> anyway, what you been playing? Right. So I have not been playing as much as I possibly could due to the sure. before mentioned affliction but uh, towards the sort of second week of recovery I was getting on with making my models and painting my models and uh, recently purchased a war cry uh, war band uh, I went for the splintered fangs and uh, I'm genuinely impressed with uh, the the model quality. Like, the, there are some really fiddly bits. The models aren't really um, customizable as such. There's not as many parts as some of the other ones. Uh, but the thing I like about them is they sort of slot together. You get you like nine or ten units done. And I've started painting them, and I'm I'm really 
I want to say I'm, imp I'm impressed on a personal level of my skill, but I think I'm getting better at it, and I think yeah. some of the figures really stand out when they've got the paint on them. You showed me the photo of your yeah. kind of like, uh, they're like almost like Spartans, aren't they? Yeah, they're like kind of, yeah, like Greek uh, Spartan warriors with uh, venom and poison, essentially. Um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure on the backstory of where they've come from in the Age of Sigmar realms, because it does say a lot of the figures you can use um, within your like chaos armies but i would not know where they've come from because they're quite varied yeah uh but yeah we're going to play the game at some point looking forward to it uh some of the rules i've been reading up look really interesting they've kind of taken the dice uh like you sort of like allocate dice um to use special abilities a bit like keystone uh, no blackstone, blackstone fortress keystone fortress <laughs> Black <laughs> blackstone fortress yeah which is kind of an interesting take on it i'm curious to do that the fluidy fluidy the movement is more fluid uh, it seems like rather than kind of going, oh, I need to make a climb, I'm going to do this, you kind of just do all of it as long as you've got enough sort of space within your move allocation, which is really, really, really cool. So a lot of the sort of terrain they've done now is very kind of low to sort of mid-range. So it kind of involves you kind of sort of jumping up and kind of sort of ducking and diving and sort of hobbling over stuff, which I really think is kind of a... I think it's just going to make things a bit more fluid. Um, you don't sort of move all your units at once. You choose which ones to activate. Uh, not all units are on the board, some come in sort of on the second or third part of the reserve. So it's, it, again, I haven't played it yet, but in theory it sounds different enough. I might be wrong because I've not played all of like Warhammer games and stuff, but it might be different enough that it could be kind of fun. Okay, cool. Um, other than that, just played a bit of Warhammer, uh, finally got my Orc Stomper out on the, the field, um, made a really stupid move. Uh, Placed it down in front of some uh, terrain and then realised it can't climb. So it's basically just stuck there, moving back, doing a shuffle, moving back, doing a shuffle, moving back. Unleash the hounds. Basically, I filled it to the brim with burner boys, and uh, yeah, my, our friend Matt was not happy when I was just like, yeah, they're all coming out now. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Well,. I haven't had too much chance really to play mm. much. Uh, mm. We did mention on the last podcast that we were about to play Crocodile. We played it. So we did. I forgot we played it. We did play a couple of games beforehand, but then we kind of like, oh, uh, me and Daryl played beforehand. Yeah, uh, yeah just Ian, getting the feel of it. Ian hadn't played. Turns out Ian is an absolute beast at Crocodile. I don't know if you used to flick coins as a kid, like that school game. I cannot remember what it was. We used to flick coins at each other's, like, sort of, they'd make a goal, didn't they? And, like, you'd do it and flick it, or you hit your knuckles. Either he was pro at that, or he's just got really dexter, like, Finger-wise, like dexterity, it's unbelievable. The thing is, it's an interesting game because uh, the way I kind of was playing the game at first was I was trying to get... So, okay, let me explain Crocodile first, just in case you haven't heard of it before. Essentially, it's a big, round, wooden table that you buy. Uh, it is a traditional game that originated in Canada. And the idea is you're flicking pucks you've got 12 each basically if you're playing a one-on-one -on -one game or in a team game you sit opposite each other and you have six uh, pucks each between the two of you um, your aim is to kind of flick your pucks into the scoring areas and have the highest score at the end of the game so in other words all your pucks that are on the table at the end all get added up um, you can knock one another's pucks out the way uh, the centre hole is worth 20 points so I was aiming for the 20 point hole as often as possible mm. where it seems like a wiser tactic in the game is to try and knock as many of your opponent's pucks off the board as possible there's a real nice defence element to it which I quite like yeah so I mean if you're really good at it you'll be flicking your pucks in such a way that it would then be defended against the other one so in other words you might knock one to tap your opponent's one which hopefully would block your puck from the next puck they're gonna shoot because you've only got a limited space that you can actually flick your puck from so i feel like i've said puck way too puck much is, yeah puck's a strong word as well because you've got to get it, it you got to get it like, so one of the things i really liked about it was um you found you were trying to set up these kind of like defensive blockers if you will around uh and then you were just fine just a full-on powerful flick would knock everything completely out of the field um it comes with its risks though doesn't it it does this is the thing we were so we tried it without the gliss powder which comes with it which is almost like a kind of um it's like a chalk but yeah, quite it's, fine very fine it's a non-liquid lubricant almost <laughs> yeah it comes in powder form but it 
Right, so I was kind of under the impression that if I put a bit on there, it would do a slightly better movement. Unfortunately, it turns out that the moves I were using before to flick the uh, the pucks across, <laughs> we just get a little sound bite there, um, to move the pucks across, it wasn't actually... Um, it, it was so much easier with this glisten power that when you just sort of tapped it, it would slide across the entirety of the board. I think we had one game where you'd been using it, yeah. and I kind of had the feel for the pucks about right. Which you when do I was to start off it. with, yeah. And as soon as I moved over to the Gliss it's enhanced such a ones, different game. it was just, man... It, the thing is, I would say I prefer it with the Gliss purely because those kind of light taps that you sort of fumble on with the normal, um, without the Gliss, they actually kind of work as you you want them to work. So it's like a tiny tap, and it does go sort of realistically just a couple of sort of centimetres forward which is really nice um, the thing I really like as well is the fact that it doesn't matter how much of you is kind of within the other line you always take the lower score so mm. this was another thing you could kind of do you could kind of tap your guy enough knowing you're going to get a 15 but knock the other dude slightly out so they would get a 10 so it's yep. almost like trying to control their score by using your puck so you always kind of you would sacrifice some some you'd flick so hard that it would fire off the thing but you'd lock someone else's off so yeah, it was. We found there was some. It's really interesting plays. Yeah, so love the game. One of the really interesting things about it is if you use your own puck to knock into one of your own pucks, in order to try and then knock an opponent's puck out of the way. If you fail to hit an opponent's puck when you do that, every single puck that you used gets wiped off the board. If you fail to strike yeah, that, an opponent's one, that happened and a few times, didn't it? Yeah, there were a few times where uh, three of <clears throat> our own pucks were hit. And none of the opponents were, meaning all the pucks get removed from... Well, the three pucks that were hit get removed from the board. That is a massive score. That's like potentially 45 points of your score knocked off at the end if it went horribly wrong. This is the thing. I mean, what was the points limit to win the the levels? Uh, So you keep playing rounds until one player has a total combined score across rounds of at least 100. Yeah, so one of the first games me and Stephen played, Stephen nearly had a hundred, or had a hundred straight up in the I first, like hundred in the very first, first, first yeah. game. So that's one round done. So it can, it can go really quickly. Yeah. Um, but you find you're mostly scoring, unless you're really bad like I am, you're mostly scoring between forty <laughs> to sixty per game. So you, you're going to get it in two rounds, realistically, unless there's this kind of. Um, well, I guess if both of you go over 100, it's kind of almost a chase to see if someone can even go like 160 or something, or if they can try and hit it even harder, which is, yeah. it's never necessarily, oh, it's over, unless it was Steve versus me or Ian versus <laughs> everyone, apparently, because yeah. Yeah. Ian was really good at it. Yeah, he only, uh, we played a lot of games of it, and I think he only lost one game. Well, we played winner stayed night. on, and he, yeah, he just stayed on. He eventually ended up like, just saying, right, I, I forfeit. I, I forfeit. Just, just to let me and Daryl play one another, basically. <laughs> but yeah, um, God, that was so bad. Okay, the only other thing I really want to talk about is I have been reading, not playing, uh, Never Going Home, which is a really interesting RPG uh, based on a kind of Cthulian World War One scenario. Oh, this is the one you showed us. Yeah, yeah. This so cool. it's all set in World War One. And some big evil magic has been unleashed, so people can play as any of the forces that were involved in World War One, and you've kind of got this common threat that you're all fighting against. So all of a sudden, you've got a group which could comprise of an Englishman, a Frenchman, a Russian, and a German, for example. <laughs> so not going to touch that. So one of the really cool things about it is you do have a corruption uh, tracker to Ooh, your characters okay. in it. So you can basically take five points of corruption over the course of a game. And if you hit that five points of corruption, uh, your character at the end of the mission leaves the party. I imagine you could tie it into a story and have them explode into some big mutant monster thing. But um, but the only two people on the or in the game that actually know how far along they are on the corruption tracker is the person themselves who controls the character and the GM. They're not meant to talk to the other players about how far along they are. It's really interesting because there's also a magic system to the game. Oh, okay. But every single use of magic 
has the risk of further corrupting, corrupting you. So, so the corruption thing, does that mean that eventually you'll betray people or does it not does it not have aspects well, on that kind of thing? The way they actually mention it in the book is they just walk away from the party. So they they, they just have to leave. Yeah, but or I imagine become you could, something or you could quite easily story tie it in because yeah. they basically they've gone mad. So you could probably tie it in with some sort of related story or something like that, probably in a later game because Otherwise, you'd have this big showdown at the end of the game against one player who's taken all the or like too much corruption and has become some sort of monstrosity, and I, they've kind of got to sit out and watch everyone else fight it. Yeah, I guess I like the idea of yeah, like you said, carrying on to another game where the big bad is the previous player's character that took over. Yeah. The, like say Steve's character or my character or something. Like I became a hideous squid monster, and then in like the <laughs> next game. Everyone has to sort of fight the hideous squid monster, and it can be called Darrow, yeah, or something like that, which would be kind of cool. So, I mean, it does have kind of like cultist level people, and like mm. I, I think they're like black priests or something That's like that cool. that control magic and stuff. So, and they they're all in different levels of monstrosity and threat, I suppose. And I like to play that. Yeah, it sounds really really cool. It's getting the time to play it. I mean, some of I the know. monsters kind of like like I said, varied from like the cultists to. A, a biplane that you can see just flying in the sky and there's no way of telling what it is until oh, wow, okay. it's set itself on fire and is flying towards <laughs> you. Uh, basically Captain Boat, basically by a skeleton at the front that's of it. That's quite cool, that's quite uh, cool. Yeah, there's lots of really cool monster, uh, other monsters like detailed in it as well. I, I think there's kind of like, almost like a siren kind of yeah. thing that uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of like beckons the soldiers to join them and then they disappear and something horrible happens to them. But um, one kind of siren. Yeah, it's it's got a lot of really really neat concepts to it. Uh, the whole setting in general is quite good because of course there was always talk, wasn't there, about uh, generals around World War. Like I think it was more around World War Two really than World War One, but there might have been a bit of it in there as well that had ties to the occult. Funnily yeah. enough, I think uh, they cover it in Hellboy. They do. They, things, like so. um, the Nazis have their own like kind of occult science division. Um, they kind of bring that up in quite a lot of films, actually. I've noticed in, uh, what was the other one? Uh, well, Captain America and the Winter Soldier, obviously, the original Hydra was like part of the offspring of uh, like the Hitler science thing, which I imagine it was possibly based on some truth. Like I, I don't know the actual facts, but I imagine there was probably some testing of some sort trying I'm, to get that. I'm pretty sure there was a mansion in Germany Oof. that uh, I can't remember which... It's quite a famous general, and I've forgotten which one it is. I oh, wouldn't like to name one, but the apparently, one with, like experiments and people and stuff. Yeah, oh, apparently yeah, there yeah. is um, kind of like a cult symbi symbolology and stuff like that all around the mansion. Oh, I know the one you want about. Yeah, I read about it. I can't remember, but yeah, I remember. I, but there I mean, was like a yeah. It goes to prove that when you have all this science fiction based around it, there's kind of like a basis there's a layer of truth. Yeah, like um, obviously nothing really happened, but or did it? No. I tell you what, a good film to watch about that is called Overlord. Oh, jeez. Yeah. So I think that. originally the plan was it was going to be tied into the Cloverfield para, uh, like family of films. Um, I can't remember if it is. I don't think this one is because it doesn't have any ties to it. Because although uh, originally the Cloverfield stuff was all meant to be like anthologies, but they tie slightly together. Uh, yeah, the Overlord one essentially is. Um, yeah, I don't want to spoil it, but it is kind of monstery. Um, I really enjoyed it, but I'm kind of into that kind of gory, kind of zombie-ish, Nazi kind of thing. Like, without kind of tying it all together, but it was it's a good enough story, and it was quite an enjoyable to watch. I would okay. definitely, I would definitely recommend it. Daryl, would you like some news? I would love the news. Feed me the news. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, to start off, Game Board One is an interesting little com concept that I've just read about just today. Okay. So details may be a little bit sketchy. It's essentially uh, almost like a glass tablet kind of thing oh, that okay. you would put in the centre of a game table and it would emulate a game board and yes. everyone could do things like they could attach their mobile phones to it. So in other words, if you were to play poker on it, for mm -hmm. example, you'd have your hand of cards on your phone rather than actually, rather than actually holding a hand Ooh, of cards. Okay. Um, apparently you can stitch them together. So in other words, if you've got multiples of these... Um, what these take like these game things. board ones, and just kind of attach them together. You could technically make a bigger board in the center. It S sounds interesting. So we saw some stuff like this 
Yeah, not to this level, but we saw, um, I think it's mainly for D&D, &D. Uh, a lot of people use these kind of like, well we saw, ta when we were They're building our table, around. there was this kind of screen in the middle which you could yeah. set at as a kind of, um, uh, well yeah, as your entire kind of pitch or whatever you want to, or like field or whatever, which I really like the idea of, because it's never, you don't need a game mat, you don't need any of that kind of thing. But playing it with like phones and apps and stuff might be quite useful. Yes, so I think the idea is a lot a of player these, card, I guess. Yeah, a lot of these D and D uh, like TV style mats and stuff like that. I believe they're just kind of like touch screen kind of, oh, like projectory type things. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you interact with it through touch screens and things like that. Uh, this is actually going to be something that's going to you're going to be able to buy games for basically oh so its own sort of system so it's going to be its own system it okay. didn't sound like it sounds like it could be used for rpgs and things like that but i it, imagine it's eventually someone yeah, yeah yeah this is actually advertising game board game board board game stuff uh it's a bit of an it crowd reference oh, there by yeah, accident yeah. but um but yeah, it's the idea that, like I said, you're all going to be able to have secret information hidden on your phones. You can do an extendable map. It's just a lot of this relies on third-party support, I feel, if you're going yeah. to get more interesting stuff for it. So the example they were giving on the news piece that I saw... Sorry, a second. I will find out the source for you. Steve's it's got from... a magic device underneath. <laughs> you can scroll for who were the news. This story actually comes to us from VentureBeat.com. And the article on there seems to show that it's... They seem to just show the poker example on there. Yeah, which everyone would, yeah. So it makes me think that, at least to begin with, it's going to be very basic games. It's not going to be anything too grand, I suppose. They have to have that third-party support from actual board game developers mm. in order to actually string this together. And I mean, you do already have, obviously, board game developers uh, developing games for, say, the Switch... Which yeah. actually I have been playing to just to go back a section here, an entire section. Um, oh God, uh, Raiders of the North Sea. Oh, is it good? I did purchase it. It's okay. Okay. It's, it's all right. It's got an okay from Steve. And we'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so yeah, it kind of depends on that. I don't know how transferable it's going to be from games like that, like the people who already have things in motion and in place for the console and PC gamers are possibly going to be able to transfer stuff to this should it become popular. Yeah, the the question... only... Yeah, this is the problem. I wonder if they're trying... If it's going to be solely based on other like third-party people trying to sort of sort them out, if you will. Yeah. That's where your issue is going to be. Like, say people don't adopt it, like they didn't adopt the Wii U as such. Yeah. And that kind of sort of flopped quite hard. Yeah. Um, that's your issue, isn't it? Because I, I think the difference between the ones we've seen, the, 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 the difference between the ones we've seen was obviously they are just projectors and the limits to them are just whatever computer you're using or software. So essentially, if you're that minded you probably do it yourself i imagine there's there's yeah. you know there's software there that's just yeah you just build a thing in paint and stick it on there and it projects it kind of thing which is if you're only using rpgs or maybe even actual games you might be just sort of scanning the board and big it up which would be quite nice yeah i just i'd like to see this but i just don't know it the problem is is it looks as if it's going to be expensive well, from, yeah, from the, the looks of it it looks expensive mm. and if how kind of big is the unit I'm not too sure. I don't know whether it's got any dimensions and not even on it here. They have got pictures on there, but it's kind of hard to tell. So that was it, the flat sort of screen? Yeah, so it's kind of like, oh, God, we've lost the entire thing now. Oh, God, no. It was. It is kind of just like a flat screen. You can kind of get an idea of it there. It it's, looks like a hob. It's quite <laughs> small. It looks like a ceramic hob. The thing is, I don't even know whether that's one... I mean, they're well, saying the Game phone, Board 1 can replace old board games. I imagine that's talking about more traditional board games and things like that, because this is not going... <sighs> in fact, it even says in the article that they're not looking to replace board games, they're looking to enhance them. This so. goes back to something we were talking about, the Snakes and Ladders. The Snakes and Ladders? We were talking about, weren't we talking about Snakes and Ladders at one point in a podcast and about... I we really we were bad mouthing snakes and ladders. I'm pretty sure. Oh, we were. I'm pretty sure we we've bad mouthed snakes and ladders. Well, now we've got a digital version. Oh, we God. can get snakes and ladders on this board. I'm just saying it might reinvent the game. Funnily enough, they do actually mention in there that the creator of the game board they they're actually from India. 
All right. And, and they said, ladders. They actually said that when they first moved to America, a lot of uh, what helped them learn the language and things like that was playing board games with the local kids. And right. they use shoots and ladders, as they call it in America. <laughs> uh, they actually do use that in the shoots article as... Uh, an example of how it brings people together. There you go, so. guaranteed probably to get Snakes and Ladders on day one release. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Oh, right, let's see what else we've got. Do you know the popular game League of Legends? I know of the popular game League of Legends. Well, Riot Games, mm. who run League of Legends, yes. did a board game a little while ago called Mechs and Minions. It got very, very popular. It sold out very, very quickly. It if I remember right, it was quite an expensive one to buy. We never got managed to get hold of a copy of it. <coughs> but uh, I hear nothing but good things about it. It's meant to be a really, really good game. Okay. But Riot Games have filed a couple of trademarks. Oh. So uh, Riot Tabletop yep. has been trademarked, which makes it sound like... They might be going straight into... They are going into board game development. They also trademarked, bear with me here... Usually I have this in front of me. Uh, Tellstones. Sounds like it's going to be the first game that they're going to be working on. There's no real details on what they're doing. But it's interesting because we've been talking a whole lot on the podcast about the kind of like how board gaming and video gaming kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, they're starting to kind of become almost one. Yes, yeah, exactly. And this is just further proof of it, really. Obviously, Riot have been a huge contributor to the whole esports genre. Obviously, League of Legends is... It's huge. Well, it's still huge. It is huge. It's still huge. Uh, in terms of... Is it MOBA games or something they're called? Uh, yeah, MOBA games, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's... Yeah, it's one of the big guns. That's, it's interesting that you... It's interesting that like people are conquering the game market, the video game market, and then kind of turning their hand at board game market. Well, it seems like everything's but doing week. well enough already, like on a one game they've done, mm. to kind of build a name up for themselves, and, and then everyone's kind of like, oh, well, they're good at this, they're also good at this, which is, yes. it's rather than just having the one, I mean, I guess if they have their own division now, which is quite nice, the board gaming side of it, but... Well, most of the time, like, an RPG game... Um, <laughs> quite literally has an RPG rule set behind it. Yeah, well, so, so, you know, a lot of these things are transferable between video gaming and board gaming. Uh, you have to think, you, a lot of the challenges in terms of mechanics and things like that are generally similar between the two. Yeah, like the dice rolls mechanics are hidden behind the coding, but yeah. Oh god, yeah, you've got random number generators all the time in, in video games, it's just you don't see them. So... Yeah, it's interesting. It is actually something which I wonder is if more, kind of expected. I wonder if more people will start getting on the games. Like, video game developers start going, especially like the heavy hitters that are really good at like doing story-driven RPGs, like you say, or anything like that, maybe start bringing out. Because we've noticed a couple of... It's going both ways, because you notice, obviously, there's board games based on video games. Yes. They may not be great. Some might be really good. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're based on everything, but... It's interesting to see that then also that there are now video games that are also either based on or direct kind of versions of the games the funny, on like consoles and stuff. The only thing I find quite funny about that is, although you would expect transferring from a video, being a video game developer to a board game developer would be relatively simple, mm. going the other way I think is a bit more difficult. Like for example, I think a lot of these, the people that make the board game kind of sell the license to video game companies to make. I don't think there's very many board game developers that are moving into making video games. However, it no. seems to be that this whole thing with Riot Games, it seems to be working the other way with them. I don't know whether it's done it before. I believe the old Bioshock Infinite game was done by Fantasy Flight, mm. I believe. So I think traditionally a lot of these video game sort adaptions, of sub out to kind of... yeah, they do still get third-party board game developers in order to actually make the games for them. So yeah, uh, it's wait, what was the one that was made by Capcom? It was the Resident Evil, wasn't it? Resident Evil was board actually game, made yeah. by Capcom, wasn't it? I am not a hundred percent sure. Um, I tell you what, keep talking. I can okay. find out for you. Waffle, waffle. I'll go talk about uh, Warhammer stuff. I noticed the other day that they're bringing out a few more. Um, like Shadespire stuff. They bring out a whole new season. 
Um, so they've already done this once. So obviously this you is the started off with Shade Spire and then it went into one. Night Vault. Yeah, this is the third one then, I guess. Um, it looks really good. I think it's got the uh, the Beasts of Chaos, or what are they called? I the problem is we played the original one, didn't we, me and you? I really like it. We played it, and then you managed to get hold of a lot of the actual decks and the cards and stuff. Uh, Ian wasn't too keen on it because of the fact it was like card based and you couldn't really do much with the models and such. I really liked it because it was more of just kind of a board game in a way with cards. Yeah. Um, you really liked it. It's small enough to sort of take around and do stuff with. I wasn't keen on the fact that you could build your own deck and kind of mix and match and stuff. Yeah. But the Night Haunt one looked really, really good. And yeah. this one also looks really, really good. But it's just kind of. I don't know where to jump in on it because I want to. I wanted to get it myself, but knowing I'd only play it with these guys is no point. If I'm perfectly honest yeah. with you, um, the whole point of the seasons is to create a jumping in point. So, in other words, you can take the figure sets from Night Vault, yeah, and you can play them against ones from Shade Spire and vice versa. So are the cards interchangeable as well then? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, oh, I think you can use them across across all the um, okay. different versions of it. So I think it's literally what it's doing is every time there's a big box game release, this is kind of, hey, you could buy this now and you can get on board as well because I actually did hear, although I bought both Night Vault and the Shade Spire big boxes. Oh, you got Night Vault as well? I did get the Night Vault one. Um, I very quickly learned that you don't have to buy the big vault, uh, the Night Vault big box if you already have the Shade Spire one because essentially all you're getting is the materials again. Uh, it has a different set of cards and a different set of uh, starting figures, but those are all readily available anyway if you already have the original starter set. Oh, okay. So, yeah. that's. So, I might, I might jump in and get the third one then, because I really like the fact that it was kind of a smallish game. I, I like the idea of that. And then if you like any of the armies from any of the uh, previous so, versions, you can actually just buy them and you can just yeah. insert them into your game. So, yeah, I think these... You know, it's kind of like what they do with Warhammer 40,000 as well. You see loads of different versions of the starter box coming out. Oh, there and it's always more or less the same, yeah. Yeah, it is pretty much the same, just with different armies that you're Because I think with. they released another kill team, we were looking at it the other day, they released another kill team starter set, which was like uh, the Tau Empire and um, Space Wolves. And okay. we kind of looked, well, it, at the time when we first got kill team, I think Matt had a Tau force. Sure. He got rid of it, he's now using uh, Death Guard. But <clears throat> we were saying that how I quite like the look of the um, Space Wolves and he already liked the towers. So if that had been around the first time around, we probably would have got that because neither of us, I don't know anyone. I mean, Ian did start trying to make some kind of um, Adeptus Mechanicus guys, but I wasn't fussed by those and the Gene Stealer Colts wasn't fussed by those. So it's kind of like I got it for the terrain, the board and the components, but the figures I was... I haven't used. I mean, I've started using them now to cut them up and make them into weird things, but other than that, no. Okay. Um, they are bringing out some new Primaris Captains I looked at today. There was one that was the Salamanders one, and that was actually really, really cool. Yeah. Um, I like the new sculpts. I don't know anything else. This is where Ian <laughs> would jump in. And say about the law. Sadly, he is busy. He today. is. Yeah, he's doing a grown-up thing. I think he might not be with us for a little while, possibly. Oh my god, he's passed he's, on. He's uh, yeah, he's he's a very busy boy at the moment, and uh, it you may have to do with just me and Daryl for a little while. But what we'll do is we'll get a cardboard back. cut out. Yeah, we'll get we'll do something badly drawn. Oh, oh we're gonna hand draw it. I'm gonna hand. We're gonna hand draw an Ian cardboard cut out. Okay, oh, the things we could do with that. We'll we'll make sure the top half is Ian. <laughs> we'll deal the bit with the, you can see. The we'll the we'll deal with the bottom half, and that'll be the fun. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so. That's probably could be taken way out of context. Let's hope. Yeah. Let's hope. <laughs> uh, Steamforge Games Ooh. published the Capcom uh, inspired Resident Evil Two game. Does that make sense? Steamforge Games. Steamforge Games made the Resident Evil Two game. Okay. They published it. Okay. Uh, it was designed by Matt Hard. Matt. Hart, Richard Loxham, and Sherwin Matthews. I like Matt Hart. Yep, Hart. No, like that Hart. was a slip of the tongue. Wow. Right, Freudian okay. slip, you might say. <laughs> Some might say. Boom! Okay. More news. More Feed news. me. I'm hungry. Okay. 
Next, I want to talk about a bit of drama on Kickstarter. Okay. So, there is an RPG that was uh, finished on Kickstarter a few months ago called Kamigakari. Uh, the idea is it's a very popular Japanese RPG okay. that has been going through a translation, and that's what the Kickstarter is doing. So it's bringing funding the, the translation. Mark. Yes, okay. it's developing the translation. It's got beautiful artwork to it and looks really interesting in concept. It's kind of you're all playing pretty much godlike characters. That's quite cool. Fighting a galactic threat okay. is essentially what it is. Um, I'd get on that. So you, it's kind of like you're you're not struggling for ability or anything like that. You're all badasses basically from the beginning. Looks really really cool. And well, we hear about Kickstarter horror stories. This is actually one that I've backed myself. So oh. I've seen all these these emails myself. So fair enough. We are. This was is obviously based in America, so these timings are based on GMT uh, or British Standard Time, rather than say I don't know whether it would be Pacific Standard Time Eastern or Pacific Eastern Standard it Time. Ch or... It changes with them, doesn't it? Because they've got two they've got two time zones. It does, yeah. So what I'll say is at three thirty in the morning in the UK, UK Standard Time. We got an email which basically read, Sorry for the late update, God Hunters. Things are a little hectic in my life right now. There's unfortunately not a lot to say this month. Translation is continuing, though slowly. I'll be able to explain why in a future update. And we're nearing completion. When the final text is completed, I'll put an update here to tell you when you'll be able to download the completed final manuscript. This will be, as said previously, the entire book in English without art or layout. I can't promise it will be this month, but soon. So, okay, things happen. People get behind on production. Oh, God knows. Two hours later, wow. a second email titled, Critical Update, please read. I will not read you the entire thing, because it's quite a lengthy one. But basically, accusations of the lead on the game... Uh, stealing money from backers, basically taking money for themselves and with no intention of actually providing a finished product at the end of it. So the group is called Serpent Sea Games and they are claiming this person that sent the second email, it's not the project leader. Right, okay. It was basically someone else, an employee that wasn't happy with the direction that the game was going right, in, okay. whether their accusations are actually true or not. They are claiming that their boss had admitted to stealing all of the backers' money. Now, we have before had an email saying that the project leader had to go to hospital I think right okay and yeah, yeah. needed to withdraw funds earlier in the uh, campaign so in other words a lot of the charges for postage and things like that were taken early right um, apparently and to be honest I'm pretty sure I remember them saying that this was to pay hospital bills that were urgent so there has been a layer of transparency to a point before however <laughs> oh, no this email is claiming that those were lies and that the money was just, just taken. taken. And basically, the people who were going to print the game, uh, the book, when it was originally, uh, eventually going to be released, are called Crack and Print, and they are under a few financial troubles at the moment. So you can see that they were having a lot of difficulty. Um. However, it turns out they've actually gone bankrupt and they're not going to be able to pay the money back that has already been paid to them in order to print the book. Okay. So, basically, this goes on, and there are accusations being thrown around, um, basically saying this project is not going to be finished, that certain members of Serpent Sea Games were looking to buy the license from Serpent Sea Games, or at least right, get them okay. to relinquish the license so that they could go away and Try independently yeah. finish the book and send them off to the backers, basically. Um, what happens after that is two hours later... Oh my god, this is only... <laughs> so, this is another two hours later... 
Oh. We then get another email. This time from another member of staff that is not the project leader, nor right. the people who had sent the emails before, right. claiming things are fine and that everything <laughs> has been blown out of context. They admit to not being a PR guy, that a lot of the facts that the previous person uh, were claiming were true are not true, and that the project was still on track. So for someone else to get involved is then kind of it's starting sketchy. to get a bit, yeah it's starting to, it's get a bit starting to look very very dodgy this is then finally followed up another two and a half hours later <laughs> providing clarification and this is where they come clean about the company crack and print going into administration right, okay. there are funds that may not be able to be um salvaged i suppose but however the project leader is the actual project leader the actual project leader this time is promising that the book is coming has said that they are trying to recoup the five thousand five hundred dollars i think they said uh that was paid to crack and print that they're currently seeking legal action to get that money back <sighs> right um and Basically, they're claiming if they want refunds, once they've recouped that money, they're willing to give them. Otherwise, you can stay on board and see whether this project actually comes through. Now, this is a mess. This is <laughs> just absolutely all over the place. I think you can kind of tell that there had obviously been some sort of argument in their office before yeah, the first email kind of was like... sent. And it feels like that first email that got sent triggered... The rest of the people. Everything else. Uh, all of a sudden, you have accusations of stealing going round, claims that the project isn't going to finish, people then defending one another. I mean, this God. is the problem. Is, that is a PR nightmare. Oh, God, it is. It's, uh, it's one of those things that could really put a person off of Kickstarter. Yeah, especially considering, I don't know how much you put into it, but, well, everyone put into it. If there is no way to get that money back, well, like how are you? This the, is the thing. How the are you gonna? Is, the problem is, is when a company files for bank bankruptcy. That is to say, they have no money. Yeah, they have no money to give to anyone. A lot of the times, when places claim bankruptcy, they don't have to pay their staff who they owe money. Yeah, to. which is uh, yeah, which is what a lot of people do. Whether it's to clients, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, believe it or not. Um, I don't. <laughs> Why not? Think... I don't really know the legal sides of everything. I don't know whether there are people that uh, a customer who has paid for a product that they're not, now not going to get would claim back because that's a little different. I guess if you write... The thing is, is when you're paying someone, someone for something, you're almost entering a contract. Yeah, you are, which they should then... You're going to provide us this... And if they can't, and we're giving usually you this it's money. a reimbursement of some sort. Usually, yes. And this is where someone could probably... Consult legal. Advice. Legal. I think where there's blame, there's a claim. And now there's blame. And also, I think the other thing is there's no smoke without fire. Yeah, and that's it quite. It seems like that in the case of this project, it goes beyond the problems with crack and print. It sounds. I love like how real... it takes. What was it? Six hours from the original. Pretty much, yes. It takes six hours from the original for them to release in official statement by the project leader followed by two unofficial statements <laughs> to say we're cool it's fine don't worry yeah i just i don't know how big they are how like how many people are working for them but for the for it to go out of <clears throat> to get out of hand that far and that quick before someone who's officially allowed to talk yes to jump in and try and sort of stop it after everyone's kind of read probably lengthy emails like you were the pages you you were going through a second ago was just like one two three kind of thing to read all that and then go yeah actually all right look we'll come true we'll come clean they have gone into like administration or whatever so then you're kind of going well hold on if that's true yeah is the rest of it true has their stuff this... been stolen like so very bad the thing is is this is a timely reminder that Kickstarter is a risk. Every oh, single time nice. you back a project, you are taking a chance on someone. You're basically, unless it's a big company, like for example, Call Mini or not, yeah. um, you know what they're about. Awaken Realms as well. 
I will uh, say the Woken companies. Realms are a big company, but they by no means get anything done on time. No, they don't get anything <laughs> done on time, but they get the job <laughs> done. They get it done to an so, amazing level. Like, I mean, I've got some here, and I won't. But we we've got some stuff here, and you've back to cut. Uh, you've back one, haven't you? Yes. And I think Nemesis has just come out, maybe on retail, it's, or it's starting to. It was a couple. Uh, it was about a month ago, I think. Yeah, or I've like seen that. it. Like we've seen it about, and again, an amazing game. Reviews. All their games get amazing reviews. I don't mind waiting for something that's superior. So this is the thing. This is the problem, is that all of these companies that are selling stuff on Kickstarter, they're not all big companies. No. They're, some of them are very small. Or just a couple of people. Very small offices, yeah, are just one or two people. And you could end up investing a lot of money in someone you don't know anything about. And I remember there was... Um, <laughs> Ages ago, one of the first ever things I ever read about Kickstarter, and we're talking a long time ago, was a guy did a Kickstarter for potato salad. Yes, I remember this. And it, he was just literally a guy, and all he wanted was potato salad. That's it. That's the crux of it. I just want potato salad. And people backed it. The guy he was a genius. He made the, something. He made a ridiculous it, yeah, amount of money. He made a ridiculous money. It. People got t shirts. Basically, he got enough money that he cut his potato salad, but then also decided the stretch goals were going to be just random stuff to give to people and it works so well and the guy was such a great genius that apparently he got hired as an advertising agent because he got people to back him potato salad perfect potato salad that's it and you're, you're going no I mean yeah they got rewarded back for it for like t-shirts and stuff but that's incredible yeah so it just goes to show it can be some random guy that just wants one thing like I mean, they, we've talked about this endlessly. That there's a lot of good that comes from Kickstarter. Oh, it is, yeah, there. But it is kind of, you know, it is you're treading on thin water a lot, yeah. or, or treading on thin ice, should I say? Um, it's a good way a to get smaller people noticed and then get them bigger, which is great. Yeah, but it's also bad. I mean, yeah, I remember this was a big project as well, and I think there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be disappointed by a lot of this, mm. a lot of people that are going to be put off the idea of Kickstarter. Anyway, let's move on to something far, far more positive. Daryl, do you remember when you said Dwarven Beer Fest was your game of the UK Game Expo? I did. I remember that fondly because I was in between... Oh, well, I was sandwiched in between two men. Yes, you were. Well, I think that that video was actually on... That was our follow-up video, I believe. It, was, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't our famous Three Men in a Bed video. It was our second follow-up video where we detailed everything a little bit more and both you and Ian said this was our best game of the UK Game Expo 2019. Anyway. I remember it. Anyway. <laughs> they are on Kickstarter. We really want to mention this project because we go ahead, go ahead, reach, reach. For the stars. Dwarven Beer Fest. Honestly... We Ooh. all absolutely love this game. If you've got it upside down, you do have it upside down. <laughs> there you the go. live problem. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, Bella. So yeah, uh, we all absolutely love this game. It's a push your luck game. It's a great little game. Like it's look. I mean, look at the size of it. That's my hand. That's a can of drink. Look at the size of it. It's it's perfect. It's portable. Yeah. And it's heavy. There's stuff in here. There's good stuff in here. Yeah. So. This was a copy that we actually bought at the UK Game Expo. We did, yeah. Um, I think we were, at one point we were all going to buy it, and then we decided just, I'll get it. But, <laughs> yeah, it was... It, <sighs> yeah, oh, I'll let you look speak. at that. The backs of the cards even have your initials on. I know. But anyway, um, <laughs> this is now available on Kickstarter. We're going to have links to the Kickstarter in the description. Um, they are providing this. Our version of it doesn't have the version with the additional taverns. You are expansion. getting a lot more... Yes, so essentially there's going to be a number of extra cards. They're doing really, really well. They're already, as of today, believe it or not, we record this podcast on a Thursday and it goes out on a Friday. Actually, I think this video version may possibly go out on the Saturday. It depends how long it takes me to edit. Anyway, um, they are currently sat at £3,200 of their £5,000 goal. So, just to put that out, that's not a lot. No. That is not a lot to make. Uh, I mean, they, they had a great back catalogue of games. Yes. All uniquely themed around stuff. Um, but yeah, you're getting a lot more uh, with the Kickstarter versions. Um, although we've got the base game and it's 
It doesn't look like it varies too much from the base game. I imagine they're going to keep a few things, maybe change a little bit. But uh, in terms of, sort of the extra expansions, like the tavern expansion, um, it'll so be the, the same tavern as expansion. Anything. is a twenty card expansion that you actually mm. get with this game. We don't know too much about it because we haven't played it. No. However, what we can tell you about Dwarven Beer Fest is it kind of works that you're drawing a number of drinks. Yeah. Uh, you choose how much you're going to drink. Uh, you will eventually become drunk, at which point you have to try to sober up in order to score your points that you've earned by drinking drinks. You have things like your favourite drink. You also have your longest burp. You can kind of push your luck with the drinking thing, though, because you can still, whilst drunk, try and drink as much as possible. Yes. But if you mess up, you throw up and lose the valuable points. Yeah. So it's kind of a case of, oh, well, I'm completely drunk now. I'm just going to keep going. And there are ways around with like your special drinks and stuff that you can kind of <laughs> remain completely and utterly off your face. So you've got abilities, haven't you? Yeah, you can... it's quite... It's quite it's, there's, there's tactical plays to it, which I quite like. It's nice. So that you can like steal drinks off other people. If you see someone's about to drink your favourite drink, there are cards which allows you to say, actually, I'll have that one. Yeah, well, I'll finish and that. Yeah, I'll finish that. But yeah, um, there's phases as well. There's like the pre-drinks. There's yes. the I'll get the first round in kind of thing. I, I like the fact that it's uh, like four or five rounds, and then that allows you to use certain abilities within those it's rounds. It's got a wonderful theme to it. Yeah, it's great. really, really good. It's got a lot of humour to it that we enjoy. Yeah, I mean, we. I, my only regret uh, of all the stuff I bought when we were there is not buying a couple more of their games. I was a bit reluctant. We played, we played this. Um, did we get a go on the, the Safari one? We didn't in the end. We didn't get... I think every time we went back, Someone the tables that. were always full, so we never got a chance so to So they, really were, they were demoing Dwarven Beer Fest, and they were, dwar uh, they were developing... Um, that. They were demoing... It was like a Safari game, and I'm quite into those kind of things. It looked really, really good, but every time, like yeah, like you say, we were there. Uh, and you went around a corner, and they had like a sort of uh, cabinet of all their other kind of games, and some of them were really random looking. But they, I imagine, they're really fun. There was a, there was a similar one with hobbits. Yeah, to eating do with a feast. wasn't there? Yes, a halfling feast. I think it was called. Yeah. Uh, there was a Victorian steampunk rocket building one. Um, there was. It was almost like I think it was like a necromancy zombie maker or something. You had to like uh, like build a zombie or an animal, uh, something like that. That looked really, really good. Um, yeah, there was about sort of three or four that we looked at and kind of went, Aah. but they weren't on demo, so I was a bit reluctant at the time. But I kind of regret not getting Halfling Feast. In fact, I just regret not getting any of them, like any of the extra ones. But the guys as well that made this game were great. Oh, we, super cool. we got it demoed to us by yeah. I, one I, of the creators. I think it was one of the creators. Yeah, yeah we had two people. One sort of shifted between the other one, didn't he? But yeah, but yeah, it was great. We I think we covered this before, but. One of the characters in it, the Doc Six Toes, right, was actually didn't they say he was based on a real life character? Oh, really? Yeah. One of the guys was saying to us that he was based on a real person that someone knew out of the like production team, which I think is absolutely hilarious. For those of you listening to the audio podcast, Daryl is currently searching for a very specific card. Yeah, I should really actually start putting these in like things I want to keep stuff in so I can just <laughs> see what I'm looking for. But yeah, um, honestly, I would say go off and check out this Kickstarter. We absolutely love this game. It deserves to get fully funded. Uh, if you do uh, back it on the higher levels, Where is that? you <laughs> do actually... Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry, I play these with my girlfriend sometimes, and I'm pretty sure it's her hair. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, if you do back on the higher pledge levels, I think you get some uh, files as well. If you have a 3D printer at home, you can actually print off like this big storage tankard, and you can also print off like a little oh, dice cup as well. Uh, I think... One of the unlockable goals is you would unlock actually a first player token, which is a barrel. Uh, there are just there's just loads of really neat things. So if you've got a 3D printer at home, it's really worth backing them on. Doctor the Six levels. Toes. Apparently, he's based on a real guy. For for the benefit of our YouTube viewers, would you like to show them that card? Uh, sorry, listeners at home. So he yeah, this is Doc Six Toes. I can't remember the exact story of it because it was a while back, but the guy definitely said he was based on a real person that has six toes. Fun fact. Oh okay, cool. 
We're right. Gonna, we're going to play this somewhere. So yeah, we are going to play this. You never know, we might do a little Let's Play video of this maybe or something for the channel. We're thinking about doing it. Yeah, like a like a preview play, I guess we could call it preview play. Yeah, sure. This, yeah. this is the problem with... Because where Steve and I, Steve mainly more than I, uh, back a lot of Kickstarters, we get a lot of stuff before other people get it like sort of mainstream, if you will. I'm not saying we're big and huge by any means, but the issue is we can't then put it on a play view because we feel like it's not fair yeah. to review an item and then say, hey, you can't get this for six yeah. months. Or if someone was to... You're not getting it or, or whatever. If someone was to watch the review video maybe two months in or something like that and they think, oh, I'd quite like to back that and then they go and they can't back it anymore. This is the thing, yeah. This is a lot of the issues with reviewing Kickstarter games. It just doesn't seem very fair to the viewers, really, to have reviewed something that they then can't have. Yeah, I mean, it's great to give an honest review of stuff. I mean, by no means, this is, this is a great game. We're not just saying it because it's on Kickstarter, get it, kind of thing. But it, I mean, this is it. This is all you're getting. And some dice, and some characters, and yet it's so amazing. It is, yes. Like, it's, it's like, this goes back to our travel stuff. Like, this is easy to port. You can just put it wherever you want. Whereas, <laughs> this other Kickstarter, Lords of Helios is not. <laughs> Again, for the benefit of the audio listeners, Daryl just held up the box of Lords of Hellas to the camera. And broke his back, because it's so <laughs> heavy. <laughs> okay. Right then. Need the dividers of these. I think we have an audience question. Oh my! It's a rather quick one. Oh. oh. And it comes from Ben, and he asks, dice or cards? Wait, is this, is this Mr. Beebles himself? This is not, no. Uh. This is... A Ben who very kindly emailed us. Oh. If you would like to have one of your questions answered on our podcast, you can come and find us at mailbag at everybodydice.com and we will answer your questions on the up next upcoming podcast or we'll save it for a later one. They'll all get read eventually. Dice or cards? Dice or cards? Am I allowed to put my thinking cap on? You're allowed to put your thinking cap on. Can you put my thinking cap on? Life from communist Russia. Dice... Chooses you. Dice, <laughs> dice rolls you. I suppose, yeah. But I think there's a place for both. Yeah, we, we, we've covered this before, actually, I think, where we, we said that some games really benefit from dice rolls and yes. other games benefit from card drafts, which see, is, yeah. I tell you what, let's narrow down this really question what, a bit. <laughs> instant warmth. What, what about if we say dice or cards to settle combat? Because recently, <sighs> let's let's be honest here. Recently, we've had games like Gloomhaven and mm. Journey Through Middle Earth, which have ditched the dice in mm. favour of what's been a more critically well received card system. So this is interesting, actually, because um, I was in our local game store in Toyment, and I was actually talking to the owner about Journey Through Middle Earth. Yes. And one of the things he said he wasn't massively keen on was the cards for combat. That's interesting. He prefers dice. He says he's very much more old school on that, and he prefers rolling dice and being able to manipulate them and just kind of generally have something to kind of physically throw. Whereas I yeah. sort of think Journeys of Middle Earth works well with the cards because yeah. I was able to. We both were. I was sort of where. Right, so there's a thing called scout so basically you sort of like look through two cards pick one put the other one back any way you want and then the one that you want to keep goes to your thing and say it says something like critical or not or whatever you can then essentially keep that and know that the next challenge would be a um, something you've got a pass with a certain amount of cards and because you've picked that card and the next card on your deck that you've put there purposefully is going to be able to sort of do that for you whereas the dice, I like that it can be used, kind of, you could roll it, but then if, at the same time, with the cards, you're sort of almost prepping yourself for these challenges, and at one point, I think we had to uh, infiltrate somewhere, and I did it purely based on the fact that I had about 20 cards, and kind of had stacked my deck so hard that I could go, yeah, do you know what, let's just throw them all on me, and I'll do it, and we passed, whereas you got in a fight and didn't have many cards, and ended up getting some wounds, so it's kind of... If there was a dice thing to that, it could easily be, mainly because I roll really badly, I would have rolled all zeros or ones or something stupid, and then it'd just be like, yeah, cool, brilliant, so uh, I failed everything and die. 
I will say there's something very satisfying to having a handful of dice and rolling on uh, rolling oh, yeah. it on the table, which you just don't get with cards. But generally, in terms of uh, mechanic and being able to I'm taking actually this too <laughs> and actually being able to tactically plan out your combat, it seems cards offer so much more. But Daryl, yes, can I throw a wild card into the mix? Oh, how? How about you think about dice throwing, which uses both dice and cards? Oh, the perfect hybrid. <laughs> so the idea of Dice Throne is you actually originally roll your dice in order to make your attacks and your plays, and then you use your cards to manipulate those dice. So you can tactically change your dice rolls. Honestly, I love Dice Throne. I think it is an absolutely fantastic game, and I think it really has that combat down. So... Yeah, I have to agree, actually. It's it's a great game. I mean, I've played a couple of games uh, with you and uh, Ian and stuff. And d in general, the game's just fantastic. Um, yeah, that's a really good question, actually, because it kind of is the perfect blend. Because you've got, like you say, dice to sort of set you up to start off with. But then you, you've got your drawing phases and then your cards can change values and add values. So it's... <sighs> but I... then that's a game based purely on combat. Yes. So this is the other thing. It it almost... I don't know if it would have worked if it was just cards. This is the thing. I think this is more of a general question. Dice or cards. Um, I I've, think just, it... I've just narrowed it down for the sake of argument. And I've got to be perfectly honest with you. I've spoken before about how I have a thing for custom dice. We, yeah, I have started... <laughs> okay. His uh, love of custom dice has rubbed off on me. <laughs> Tactfully done. Yes. I, I, I can see what he means. I'm a, I'm a sucker for it. Even if it's just like a symbol on the six. I love it. But anything that's got kind of... It's not ones and zeros. or I don't know, ones and zeros. It's not one to six. It's like just weird symbols. Or it's combat dice. Or it's like an odd shaped dice. I love that. I've actually always found that in terms of feel... I much prefer dice to cards. Cards, mm. oh, I, 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 I can at times get be a sweaty guy, and sometimes when I'm holding <laughs> cards in Clam my hand, hands. and they get a little bit clammy, you can start finding ink. Sometimes, mm. sometimes starts rubbing off on your hands, and the thing is, they get you kind bent of the cards. Yeah, you kind of chip the cards and stuff. Yeah, and... whereas dice, dice always feel good in my hands. I love rolling them, and yeah, I. I think I'm going to go dice. <sighs> He's thinking. It, the problem is... <clears throat> Honestly, from a mechanical point of view, dice. I do think I prefer cards. But overall, in terms of the feel, I think dice still have their place in gaming. We've discussed this before with the whole... Um, Dice are still the best thing to use for generating things at random. And yeah, I, I'm i choosing dice. Yeah, I'm choosing dice. There I, you go, Ben. I do, I'm do. i choosing dice, but I would say that they both are welcome. I hope that answers your question, Ben. So, <laughs> you know, I love the fact there's probably a sound effect of me now, like just rolling a load of dice again. Yeah, I've chosen the dice spoken. To be honest, we could start using that for the, intro, the little sting we've got at the beginning of it. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Okay. Right then. We have a big question for to answer oh my God. before we finish. We're here. totally spoiling you guys. I completely forgot about the, the format. So, <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm going to keep these dice we out. Do, we do this. Po we're 18 podcasts in and we're already I am our... heavily dosed up on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, our question this week is how much educational benefit does board gaming have? I'm out. So, I'm out. That's so, it. okay. We've, we've, this is basically inspired by the fact that we've now covered several stories where they're always talking about how board games are being used as an educational tool for yeah, the, um, the, various the things. The last one where we were talking about the um, domestic abuse one and stuff yes. like that. Yeah. Yes, and how much potential does board gaming really have? Because I can't help but think that a lot of these games that we are talking about on here talk about it from the, perspective as, from the same perspective as Trivial Pursuit is an educational board game in that it 
inspires asking questions that <clears throat> then get answered and you learn from that. So oh. the next time that question comes up, you know the answer next time. However, I feel as if this goes deeper Are than that. Are we... In, right, so when we're using the term games, yes, are we including all forms of games that anything we've ever played board game wise? All forms of board games. So I would say games that use well, games that utilize um, something like Quadropolis, yes, where you basically have a, a grid system and have to kind of build stuff on that grid system but also be mindful of it triggering effects with other stuff so essentially it's kind of like micromanaging a small little area i think that's really good for learning to kind of it's not it's, it's i wasn't really like memory game but it's kind of like it's trying to maximize stuff so you're kind of working out the best i guess it's mathematical in a way you're trying to work out if i put a refinery here next to a garden doesn't do anything but if I put a garden next to a house next to another house next to a garden next to something and then I can make an L shape something at the bottom to maximise full points it's I think it's definitely kind of drawing the brain power more than just going yeah I'm going to put that there that's going to go there that's going to go there ah uh, kind so of thing so really in terms of teaching people say logistical value of I where you're yeah. placing pieces and stuff like that yeah okay I think yeah just general stuff like that um Anything where you have to build something like shape wise, if you a bit like Tetris, um, are we mentoring that? Uh, we can talk about Team Three. Yeah, so Team Three we played. Uh, we've got it here. We're going to play it a little bit later. But um, yeah, that was very much teaching. <sighs> it's coordination. Yeah, things like that. pretty Working much. Yeah, like hand eye coordination and just team skills. I mean, obviously it's called Team Three, but I think it when we played it initially we were quite bad at it purely based on where we had sort of picked our role within the team, it quickly then dawned on us that a sort of reorganisation of our team and where our sort of set skills lie. So one person, for instance, um, Ian was really good at sort of yelling out the shape sort of demands to, you know, one of us. And I was quite good at sort of putting them together, blind, weirdly. So I'm very quick at sort of moving things and shapes and fitting them in, whereas Stephen was really good at kind of like just sort of symboling out stuff. So it was... It's a really good system, but it gets it gets you kind of sort of thinking. Oh well, his strengths lie in this, and his strengths lie in this. Whereas when we replaced it to me going uh, 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 like that, and everyone's going kind of going what kind of thing? It, yeah, so I'm not really good at explaining things apparently. Whereas I think that's that's it. I'm good at doing things, but not explaining things. I think one of the things that I wanted to mention was uh, speaking from the perspective of someone who has in the past suffered from things like social anxieties and okay. stuff like that. Mm. I also find that board games really helps with that. So yeah. any board game where you're kind of put in a situation where you have to discuss with everyone else in the group things, it kind of opens up opportunities to be able to talk about things as well. So a lot of the problems with social anxieties often, or at least in my case anyway, came from the fact that I didn't know what people wanted to hear from me. Are people going to be interested by what I'm going to say and things like that? And it's just that anxiety over I mean, that. You're now podcasting, and, so... Yeah, yeah, exactly. And when you're playing a board game, you actually have those talking points there and everyone has the interest <clears throat> in that. And all of a sudden you start finding yourself more open to being able to talk to people around the table and stuff like that. And I think... It has educational value in that as well. In like building social skills. Building social skills. Mm -hmm. in, like, yes, definitely. It builds a healthy kind of um, competitive kind of spirit as well because yes. you're always going to find those people. There are, I mean, this is no, I'm not saying there are exceptions to the rule. Everyone's always going to have this. But like, there's going to be some people that are, uh, really want to win and will be just kind of sore winners kind of thing. I like to think of them as the sports crowd. Yeah. You find it a lot like in jockey sports. kind of type, which is fine. I get that. That's the place for that. But I think it kind of also teaches you that um, by no means do I win r rarely ever. There are a few times in it, and when I do, I go, oh, that was amazing. But at the same time, I, it's just fun to take part in. And that's kind of, it's developing that kind of humility to you just kind of you're not always going to win no one's always winning and if they are i'm using ian here as an example in crocodile he's going <laughs> down at some point someone let's hope andy is going to beat him i've already beaten him 
I'm fine. More than once. <laughs> More than once. <laughs> He's beaten me like 15 times, but I've beaten him once. Okay, That's well, fine. I'm going to get a win one day. <laughs> but yeah, my, my point is, it's just it builds up that kind of skills to kind of accept that, um, you know, you're not always going to be winning, but sometimes it's just fun to take yes, part. definitely. And then you've got... Yeah, there are. There's loads of there's loads of aspects of gaming that's going to teach people stuff. And it's it's more life skills than anything else. It's not necessarily. It, it doesn't have to be mathematics. I yeah. mean, I know a couple of people we play with, base it mostly on mathematics. Yes. Uh, especially when they're guessing cards and stuff, and people. And there's a place for that. It's really really easy to do if you can do it. I understand that. But I think it's that kind of. Um, just it's just general social skills. I think that's probably your best. Yeah, that's probably the best option. I think yeah, like like you said, I think board games are a really good way of teaching people how to win and how to lose. Yeah. I don't know what it is about board gaming. Maybe because you're all in the same room as one another, it's usually quite a relaxed atmosphere. They're, don't get me wrong. You have games like the Game of Thrones board games. Uh, oh, what's the other one called? Diplomacy. Uh, you have games like that where which can get very very nasty but um for the most part most games will usually have that kind of feel to them where a lot of what you're doing you'll usually do something cool in a board game at some point which means that even if you lose you did that one really really cool thing at one point and that's what you're going to focus on that's what you're going to take away of, of what you really enjoyed about the game you know? yeah i think it's a really good way to kind of I guess it's just a good way to sort of get out there in a way. Yeah. Like not necessarily. I mean, we play like in a social group, and I know that um, whenever I go to like sort of gaming events and stuff, like that, I usually tend to go with people or go play with someone I know that's going to be there kind of thing. But I think there. I mean, I've done it a couple of times. I've just sort of turned up to an, like a, a tournament, not knowing anyone's going to be there. But you soon find that it's a kind of really chilled atmosphere. There's, there is a, you're not gonna, you're gonna see a guy that's gonna win, and you'll see that person, and they kind of, that's because their, you know, their head is really in the game kind of thing. They know what they're doing. Whereas, I think it's just, I would say, I don't want to say like, <laughs> so it's quite a broad thing. I would say a lot of people that go to gaming places probably would at some point have suffered from social anxiety. I don't wanna I don't wanna label it as that is definitely hit, but yeah. I would say of most of the people I have known or met or whatever, one or two of them nothing but majority of them have kind of gone, at some point I couldn't leave the house or at some point I couldn't really get on with things. I started coming here, I started meeting other people, I started doing this, I really like Warhammer, he really likes Warhammer, we can talk about it. I think it's just, um, yeah, it's definitely a really good way. I think more than anything else, doesn't matter about like <laughs> trivia. Uh, you're gonna remember that. You're not gonna remember. That. It doesn't matter about like trying to figure out mathematical things. I think yeah, it's based. I would say, definitely on social skills. Yeah. Right. With that, I think we'll close this. So if you're joining us on YouTube, we do also have a SoundCloud account where you can just listen to this if you haven't got access to a TV at the time. Honestly, we are on. All other social medias as well. Uh, Instagram at Everybody Dice Show. On Twitter at Everybody Dice. If you really like what we're doing and want to help support us, you can find us on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash Everybody Dice. And of course, you can find all of our content on one place at www.everybodydice.com. If anyone's interested, I just rolled four fours. That's. Highly improbable, but... I well did done. somehow do it. You did. And a seven and a two. But let's not talk about those ones. So, yes. Shall we say goodbye? <laughs> this could be my new thing. Your new thing. Good four to everyone. Good four? Oh. 72! Goodbye. Bye. See you.